case is the secretary of Stop the War, and Adam something more, I'll let you speak. <laughs> okay, John Reeves. Okay, well, as many of you um, may realise, but some of you may not, there has been a long-term truce agreed um, this evening uh, between um, Israel and uh, the uh, Palestinian delegations in Cairo. It seems, I mean, obviously, we won't be able to say too much until the, the details fully emerge, but it seems that some of the demands, at least of the Palestinian uh, delegation, which the Israelis were unwilling uh, to meet, and that's why the, uh, the last temporary ceasefire um, broke down. Some of the demands of the Palestinians in terms of allowing uh, reconstruction material to go back in uh, to Gaza, in terms of extending the, the fishing limits, in terms of um, negotiations in a month's time to further lift the siege of Gaza, have uh, in this uh, set of negotiations um, at any rate uh, been, been met. Now I think that we should be clear that this is the most elementary, the most a basic thing that could possibly have been agreed. And the sticking point uh, up to now um, was the Palestinians' uh, refusal to simply um, agree a ceasefire when at least some of the siege of Gaza had not been lifted. And I think they were absolutely right to do that for two reasons. First of all, there could not even be the most elementary reconstruction of the huge damage that has been done in Gaza by 50 days of conflict uh, in, the last, uh, in the last exchange of weaponry between the Israelis and the people in Gaza. There couldn't even be the reconstruction of the huge damage that's been done without the lifting of the siege. It would have simply been impossible, had the pre-existing siege been restarted, to even get the building materials and the uh, reconstruction materials into Gaza. So from the Palestinian point of view, there was no point even in going back uh, to the pre-existing situation without the ability to rebuild the damage that the Israelis have done by their bombardment in this last, in this last period of conflict. But there's another more fundamental reason that there couldn't conceivably be even the beginnings of peace uh, between the Israelis and the Palestinians without the lifting of the siege. And I think it will come, become clear in the negotiations going forward from here, lifting the, Giza, the siege of Gaza completely. Because without that possibility, without the possibility of free movement, what we have in Gaza is simply a large prison camp which is periodically bombed by the Israelis. This is a strip of land which is no wider than seven kilometres, no longer uh, than 40 kilometres. It is uh, one quarter of the size of Greater London, and, and it has periodically unleashed... Well. <coughs> yeah, I'll tell you what, I'll do the speech, then you ask the questions, and then we'll go that way, shall we? Um, and, what, uh, and what I think is crucial here is that we understand that an imprisoned population, because that's what it is, an imprisoned population, which is periodically bombed by the most advanced <laughs> weaponry on the face of the earth, they reckon that the total amount of weaponry unleashed on the Gaza Strip in this period of time has been the equivalent of three of the nuclear weapons that were um, dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki <laughs> at the end of the Second World War. No people, no people could consider themselves, even at the beginning of a peace process, unless that siege was lifted. And it seems to me that this is the beginning, at any rate, of uh, any notion of uh, a peace uh, for the Palestinians. <laughs> but I think we will have to go some considerable distance further than that. That might be a starting point, but it cannot, in my view, be a conclusion of a peace. And to understand this, we have to understand why it is that ever since the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948, this happens time and time and time again. After all, this is not the first time that Gaza has been attacked. It is not the first time that the Palestinians have been attacked. It is a perpetual war, and it's a perpetual war for this reason. Because the Israeli state was founded on the principle of taking Palestinian land. 
It is a settler colonial state in which people who did not live there arrived there and started taking land from the people who did live there. And until that fundamental injustice is addressed, I don't think that we can talk about a long-term or a sustained peace. Not because, by the way, that the people who live in this area, Arabs and Jews and Christians, could not live side by side. This is one of the oldest and most long-standing lies told by the opponents of Palestinian freedom. They say that it is an age-old conflict. They say that there cannot be peace, particularly between Jews and Arabs. But let's be clear. Before the foundation of the State of Israel, before colonial settlers arrived to start taking Palestinian land for millennia, Jews and Christians and Arabs had lived peaceably side by side in the area of historic Palestine. What stopped them doing that is the creation of the State of Israel and its backing by the imperial powers. Britain, Britain, you know, perfidious Albion um, in the First World War promised T. E. Lawrence and his commander, Sir Henry McMahon, promised independence to the Arabs and at the same time Lord Balfour was promising to the Zionists that this could be the state of Israel. Nothing good can come of a major imperial power which is promising to two different groups of people for its own interest the same piece of land. And that state could not have been founded in 1948. I could not have survived for a single month at any point since 1948 without the backing of the imperial powers. The curse of all the people living in the historic area of Palestine is that the major powers decide to use them for their own ends. And that is why that state remains armed to the teeth, diplomatically and politically sustained by the imperial powers. Imagine this relationship between two states. Have you ever heard, in fact, of this kind of relationship between two states? It is not only the case, as many people already know, that Israel is the biggest recipient of US military aid. It is also the biggest recipient of US civilian aid. It is the only nation in the world that can purchase US arms directly from US arms manufacturers without going through the Department of Defense. It is the only state in the world that can use US military aid to purchase arms from third parties. It is the only country in the world that can use US civilian aid to purchase military materials. Now that is a special relationship. David Cameron thinks he has a special relationship with the United States, but the people who really have a special relationship with the United States are the Israeli government. And they are there not simply to sustain the interests of the State of Israel, that support is not there merely to sustain the interests of the State of Israel against the Palestinians. After all, it's not really worth that kind of money just to hold down the Palestinians. The purpose of the State of Israel is to hold down the Arab masses throughout the Middle East. It is, as Ronald Reagan once said, cheaper than the Sixth Fleet. It is an aircraft carrier moored to the side of the Arab lands and its purpose is to discipline and control and threaten not just the Palestinians, although it must do that to exist, but the whole of the Arab masses throughout the Middle East. And it has long been um, the view of many of us that the liberation of the Palestinians is entirely bound up with the wider politics of the Middle East, both in terms of the Israelis' ability to police the region and the peoples of the region's ability to throw off both Israeli domination and the domination of their own uh, dicta dictators. And that is exactly what is in play now in the, uh, in the Middle East. It is an alliance of reactionary uh, dictatorships against the peoples and against the Palestinians. Because in this conflict, it is the Egyptian government um, sustained and supported uh, by Saudi Arabia, the organizing center of counter-revolution in the Middle East, which has closed the Rafah crossing and imprisoned um, the uh, Palestinian people more securely and more completely even than the Mubarak dictatorship did uh, before it. So these are the wider politics, I think, of uh, Palestinian liberation. It is about the Palestinians' ability to fight for a state which is theirs, 
and which can recognize and live peaceably side by side with others in the historic area of Palestine. It is bound up with the great powers, support for the state of Israel, because they need it to police the wider Middle East, and it is bound up with the local dictatorships in the area. And therefore, we in Britain, one of the major powers responsible for this, allied to the United States, the main power that sustains this setup, have a special place uh, in, this, in this struggle. We have to say to our own government, you are arming, you are directly arming these people. It came uh, to light, even in the recent conflict, that some of the arms sales may be technically illegal. That's why the government talked about having to suspend 12 export licenses for military materials which they're supplying to the state of Israel. But that is the tip of the iceberg. It is much deeper and much bigger than that. And we have to say to our own government, you are supplying and arming war criminals. That is what the UN says. That is what the Amnesty International says, that war crimes have been committed against the Gazan people and they are being committed with weapons supplied to them by the British government and by the American, uh, and by the American government. And that's why the protests that uh, Amina mentioned at the beginning is so important. They will all be there in South Wales this weekend. The warmongers of the globe will be there. Obama, now the fourth American president to bomb Iraq, will be there. Cameron, his helpmate in every single case that he can, will be there. And all the others, the biggest, most unpleasant, most heavily armed uh, military alliance that the globe has ever seen. Backing up the state of Israel and backing up the dictatorships in the, in the Middle East. Our business is to get on their case and say that you will not do this while we have the power to stop you. And we did have the power to stop them. Only a year ago, David Cameron became the first Prime Minister since 1782 to go to the House of Commons and ask for a vote for war when he wanted to bomb Damascus and Aleppo and Homs. And he couldn't get that vote past the MPs, and he couldn't get that vote past the MPs because they couldn't face their constituents who, after 10 years and more of anti-war campaigning, had drilled it in, even to the thicker craniums, of the people in the palace of Westminster that this wasn't going to work for us. So protest works. It's forced fissures between Britain and America. It's forced them to start thinking about what they can get away with. And we need to keep that pressure on. We've had a brilliant series of mass demonstrations, the largest ever demonstration over Palestine in this country in recent weeks. We can do it, but we can do it together and in the face of this resistance, but we have to carry it to the doorstep of the NATO leaders next weekend. Thank you very much.